We are going to start with our first talk, and we have Jonathan Cooperman. Uh, I hope it, I pronounced it right, okay. <laughs> and Jonathan is an engineer at Bloomberg, uh, working on application frameworks. He has worked at Cloudflare, Brave, Twitter, Adobe in past. And he is also an TC39 delegate and co-convener of the source map task group. And today he's going to talk about the future of source map. Welcome, Jonathan. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Uh, yeah, I'm really excited to be here talking about source maps, which I feel like are a amazing technology, but has been uh, yeah a bit unloved throughout the years. And I'm very excited about all the attention and effort it's been getting lately. So um, yeah, the kind of structure for this talk will be a quick history of source maps, sort of explaining the anatomy of a source map, what's currently inside what they are, um, and specifically what is and isn't currently encoded, what information we have and what we don't have. Uh, talking a little bit about how they're generated and how they're used, and then with that kind of understanding going into our new proposals that we've been working on. Uh, I think one of the goals for the talk is to get like some feedback from you all on the proposals and kind of the stuff that we're thinking about, if it sounds good or if it sounds potentially misdirected. Um, so yeah, so please come reach out to me afterwards. I'd love to talk, and if you want to get involved, I have slides at the end for how to do that too. Uh, yeah, real quick about me. I think you said it all greatly. Uh, John Cooperman, work at Bloomberg. Um, I sit now as a member of TC39, and I've been working on the source map task group, which is underneath t the TC39 umbrella. So source maps have kind of a cool story. Back in 2009, uh, Google was kind of starting to develop these gigantic JavaScript applications for the first time and came up with the tool, which is still alive and well today, called the Closure Compiler. And so essentially, they started working on tooling that would allow them to like minify or condense or make code you know, bundles smaller and things like that, and immediately were hit with difficulties debugging that code. Um, and so they came up with this source map specification or a Google Doc with what looked like a specification in it. Um, yeah, and so today this remains like more true than ever. Like the kind of core problem that they help with is that um, with almost all applications, the JavaScript that runs on the server or runs on your client's machines is almost always in some way changed or altered from the source code that you author. Uh, and this is like more and more true with um, expanding beyond JavaScript. And so we've got like CSS and CSS now being authored from tools that also do some kind of bundling or minification or c compilation. And then with the rise of WebAssembly, we have tools, you know, code being authored in other languages like Kotlin and Rust or C++ and then run as WebAssembly. And so we have this very common problem, which is like you're running your stuff in development, but you really need some way of mapping it back to the source code that you authored so you can kind of have a good debug experience. Um, so a little bit about what source maps are. They're JSON objects. Uh, their kind of main goal is to help debuggers, like browsers, link between the, what we call the generated code, which is what's actually being run in the client, and the source code that you actually author. Um, so we kind of think about them in these three different categories, uh, names maybe to be decided later, but um, we, we think about generators, which are tools that author source maps. And so these would be like ESBuild or Webpack, SWC, some kind of builder or minifier that actually writes the dot .map file. Then we think about consumers, which are what read those dot .map files. And so those are most commonly browsers, but we've seen like a lot of cool new tools like Replay.io, for example, using source maps to kind of provide their own out of browser debugging experience. Uh, and then they're also used by a, a whole suite of these error monitoring tools. So these are tools that log you know, your client crashes to their SaaS service or something like that. And then as you kind of look through, you want to be able to see, well, where in my source code did that, did that bug come from? Uh, so the anatomy of a source map, they have quite a few optional fields, but I've sort of reduced them down to their main fields for now. Um, they have a version, which is always three. So that's the easy one. Um, it's just the number three. And then, so as you can kind of see, they've got like, if we ignore sources content for a second, they have this list of source files, and then they have this array or this list of mappings. And those mappings job, which we'll get into in a minute, is basically to take a token in this generated code where you've like hit a debugger or breakpoint, and to show you in which source file and where in that source file uh, was that code authored. And the source's content is essentially just the inline code from those sources. So index.js in the sources contains that a uh, function Greek code. The mappings are the kind of complicated part, but the rest of it is essentially just a list of source files and their content. 
So how do generators work? How do they write these source maps? Um, so if we take a really simple example, we have like file one, and it's got an add function in it. And then we've got an index file, and it imports that add function and calls it, and calls a debugger. Um, so if we go ahead and we run that through a build tool, anyone will do, you'll get this minified code, which is probably what you would expect. You know, you've got your variables and your functions have been reduced to single letter names. We see our debugger still in there. Um, but then at the bottom of it, we've got this little source mapping URL comment. And so this basically says this generated code, when you want to look up which sources it comes from, go and find a file called bundle.js.map. And in bundle.js.map, we see kind of like we saw before, except now there's two source files, and they have the content that we would think that they would have. We also have this names array, which I'm going to get into a little bit later. But for now, we've got our sources, the content of each one of those sources, and then a series of mappings. So mappings are like really the only technically complicated thing that we're going to cover here. Um, so they're basically, they're these like VLQ encoded strings. And without going too much into it, actually, Nick here has a great talk of like exactly how the VLQ encoded mappings work. But the information that is mapped inside of them is that for each token in the generated file, we'll make a mapping. And that mapping will contain information about the line and column number in the generated file, so in your minified file. And then the index of which source file created it, so we can go up to that sources array, and then the line and column in the sources array. So it would be like line you know, one, one in the generated file belongs to the zeroth source, and if you go in that source file, it corresponds to line two, two in the source file. So we can always have this relationship here. Uh, there's a bunch of cool tools to help visualize source maps. So here's one of them, and it's like some React code, and you can hover over anything in the generated, and it'll point an arrow to the source, but you can see if we pick the very first token here, uh, we can see the mapping for it would be AAAA. Those get turned into zero. Uh, and so basically, it says the zeroth column and the zeroth line of the generated file go find the zeroth. Maybe I should have gone to different numbers. Go find the zeroth uh, index of the sources, and then it, it's zero, zero. So it's basically like a mapping from a point in the generated file to a specific source and then to a point in the source file. So that's how the generators author these, and they produce these things. So now let's look at how browsers and other debugging tools work uh, utilizing them. So if we have a similar thing, we have like this function. It's got a debug statement in it, add first and second. And then we have another file that does multiply, multiply first time second. And we have our index file, like a barrel file that reads these in and calls both of them. So if we go ahead and we just pass this through any build tool, I used ES build here as an example, but any would work. Uh, they generate this minified thing, just like we would expect to see. Everything's kind of uh, shrunken down into single letter names where it can be. So then if we were to open this code in our browser, the debugger would hit, and we would get this. So we would get a debugging statement that's kind of in this JavaScript iffy with all these single letter names. One thing that's actually really nice about the browser is they go ahead and they prettify it for you. Um, but the problem here is that it's really hard to trace back where this debugger has landed to the actual source code. So if we go back to our project and we just add source map true, which is the flag for most like TypeScript ES build, things like that, and we run it again, it generates the exact same minified code as we saw before. But now back again, we have this source mapping URL comment. And then we go ahead and we refresh the browser. Oh, sorry. Uh, I got ahead of myself. So now it generates this one new file, which is the map. Uh, you can see our three files that we showed earlier, the file one, file two, and index. Then you can see this array with the add function, the multiply function, and the barrel file a bunch of mappings, and a bunch of names. So now when we go ahead and we refresh our file, we get a debugger paused again. And this time it knows we're not actually in bundle.js. Where we really want to be is in file1.js in this add function. And it has renamed the parameters, and everything is kind of as it should be. So this is kind of like the way that they work nowadays. Um, one really interesting thing, uh, if you look at, is this window over here. So we know, like at least hypothetically, how you could do what the browsers do today with like finding the file, using the mapping, getting all of that stuff, and then finding the original name. But how do they get this scope information? Uh, and it turns out this is really tricky to get, but is like pretty much demanded by all people using these debug tools. And so the scope information shows that where we're stopped in the debugger has access to two bits of local scope. One is first with a value of two, and one is second with a value of two. Uh, and so all the different tools have different ways of doing this right now, since it's not encoded in the source map itself. Um, so Chrome Dev Tools use like a series of regular expressions uh, to try to figure out like literally like are we in a function? Where is that function? Where does it start? Where does it stop? What else is in here? Stuff like that. Uh, Firefox goes and actually parses the source files themselves when you're in the debugger, um, so that they can have a better guess at exactly the scope that you're currently in. 
Uh, so this makes them, they're difficult to implement, they're non-standard, they have bugs because it's just really hard to get actual JavaScript scope without parsing JavaScript. Um, and yeah, they're, they're quite different. So uh, another area that we see some shortcomings is in stack traces. So I, I assume most people here have had this experience before where you open up your console and you get an error stack trace and everything is just single letter names and it's not all that helpful. Um, again, this information is really hard to get with what's currently encoded in the source map, especially when it comes to things like this isn't coming from the debug code, this is actually coming from JavaScript, from an error, right? Like there's nothing in that error that helps me point to the source map or the source file. Um, so there's been a few different open source tools. I work at Bloomberg and we have this open source tool called Pasta Source Maps. Again, it's kind of whole point is to get these names back when you get an error. So like I ideally, uh, when you're working at Bloomberg, if you get a crash report, it wouldn't give you the single letter RON. It would actually give you the, like you had an error at Penne or Spaghetti or Orzo. Um, and so we do this because we control both sides, the generator and the consumer, and so we add this like XCOM Bloomberg sources functions mapping, right? We add our own new mapping, and that maps, the, um, that maps those variable names from where they are in the generated code to what they actually were in the source code. But this isn't a realistic solution because, uh, and I'll go into this in a little bit later, but like we, nobody owns this full stack, right? Like these generator tools are completely separate from the browsers and like there's no, there, until recently there's no like standards body around trying to get these features through. Um, and it's not just as simple as names, like it actually gets a lot more confusing because all of these like minifiers in an attempt to make your code smaller, they do quite a bit of mangling of your source code. And so in this like very contrived example, like if you have a bunch of functions um, but Tercer figures out that it actually can reduce them all to no functions. Like now we're in a really tough place where like that debugger is located inside of Baz, but we don't even have Baz in the generated file. Like we don't have any functions there. So it gets really difficult to guess at these sources and these scopes where they might have been. Um, and with all features, it's really difficult to move forward um, because of this kind of fragmentation and like no standards process. So there's like one new feature that's come out over the years, kind of despite all odds, is this Google ignore list. Um, and so they thought it would be really cool. They've added this, I think a lot of browsers have this now, this like ability to black box certain scripts to say this is like a framework or this is a dependency, like I don't want you stopping in here when I'm step through debugging. Uh, and so they thought it'd be cool if you could actually do that kind of programmatically by having an ignore list of files that when you're in the debug step through, just never step here. Um, and so they added this ability where if you add an X Google ignore list flag to the source map, they know what to do with it, but nobody's adding it. So it's not all that useful. So they go to the Angular team and they're like, hey, like, could you start maybe implementing this if you wanted? You could mark all of the Angular core code as this thing. And so that they have in this kind of like, m you know, messy way, they start getting support for this and eventually Firefox sees it and they're like, oh, this is cool. We'll start using it too. So now you have like Firefox checking for the presence of a Google named uh, ignore list flag and it gets really tricky basically. And so in general, it's been very tough for us to add new features because of this. Um, so kind of what we've been doing over the last year, year and a half, uh, we formed a task group uh, specifically working on source maps. So this would be a collective of uh, an open invite collective of anybody who's building generators, anybody who's building uh, consumers, anybody who's building these error tools, anybody who's kind of working with source maps, uh, different languages, different like tools that compile between languages, all sorts of folks in this group. Uh, and one of the first things that we did is we kind of tackled this current specification. So this is probably a talk for a different time, but finding like dozens upon dozens of like vague areas or inaccuracies or things marked incorrectly in the current spec that everybody sort of has this like uh, secret knowledge like, oh yeah, we ignore that. Oh yeah, we know that, so, but nobody's ever written it down before. And so we've been really hard at work trying to flesh that out and make it all written down. Um, and then we've been working on these new features. And so I'll kind of go through those really quick, which is uh, embed the scope information so that all of the consumers can just simply render what function scope or what expression scope you had at that time. Uh, additionally, get the function and variable names. So it's very easy when you have like an error stack to uh, see what function and variable names were. Uh, add debug IDs, which I'll go into as a small topic, and a new proposal called range mappings. And so these are the kind of things that we've been working on over the last year. So the scopes proposal uh, has been our largest effort. And it basically is like this kind of parent category for a lot of the things that I've talked about before, which is like, when you have functions that get inlined by compilers, we would really like a way to spread those back out and know where they came from. 
uh, variable names, we would like a much easier way to know like, okay, well, I'm in this scope, I have access to these two variables, what were their original names in the source code? Um, in general, being able to just reconstruct the scope from a debug statement to say like, what did I have access to globally and what did I have access to locally here? Uh, and the way that we are doing this currently with a proposal that's on our GitHub repo is through two new fields added, which would be uh, original scopes and generated scopes. And then we can allow mapping between those so that all of these debug tools like the browsers and replay could just, when you're stopped at a debugger, they would do one mapping lookup for the actual source code and then one mapping lookup for all of the scope and name information that's involved there. Uh, the other one that we've been working on, which is going to be a larger effort because it would be outside of just our domain, would be the ability to add debug IDs. And so this helps in a few different places, but one of the main ones that you'd be able to see it would be um, in the proposal, the idea would be when errors get generated from the browser, you would have a debug ID attached to it, and you could use that debug ID to look up the source map um, that you would need to find to, you know, to find all of your uh, source information. But it comes from more than just the stack traces. Like, I think a lot of these tools, especially the error monitoring tools, run into issues when they have constantly being re-pushed, generated in source files, and they're not always sure exactly like, OK, we saw this error on like January 10th, but we're not exactly sure which source map or what the state of the source code or what the state of the generated code was back then. And so tracing through this kind of information with these long-running processes can be really hard. Similarly, if you just have a project that ends up spitting out multiple source maps, it can be really difficult to figure out uh, you know, how to get back to the source code. Uh, and then we have another proposal here for range mappings. This has another couple of uses, but one maybe the easiest to explain is that when you run your code through a mul multiple compilers, like essentially multiple steps, so like an example would be running your code through TypeScript, which would generate a source map. Um, and then running that produce JavaScript through something like Terser to minify it, which would also produce a source map. Uh, combining these mappings can get really difficult and often results in extremely low fidelity. So like you can only map from places in the source that were existent in the, uh, or in the original. And so we, what we end up doing in browsers a lot of the time is we kind of drop down to like, okay, well, we know like what line it was on. Like we know you're stopped on this line. We're not exactly sure uh, where in the line, what column or like where in the function that you're stopped. And so another example that we're talking about earlier today is that if you have like, let's say you just have simple code and all it does is just remove comments. So uh, the compile step just removes a bunch of comments. You get in this situation where you're like, okay, do I make individual mappings for every single token in this like giant bit of source code that's unchanged from the, or the generated code that's unchanged from the source code. There's no way currently to be like, oh, and then the rest of this line is like the same as it was in the source code. And so we're working on this range mappings proposal, which would add a, a new field of mappings, or a new type for mapping, sorry, called range mappings, where you could say like, okay, we removed a comment, but then starting from here, uh, this entire range can map exactly to how it was in the source code. Um, cool, yeah, so our group basically is uh, open, it's under TC39, currently we have members from, this is just alphabetical order, uh, you know, Bloomberg and Google and JetBrains, Meta, Mozilla, Replay, Sentry, a bunch of other cool groups. Uh, we're really looking for feedback on this stuff, especially, you know, as source map usage is so widespread, if people have like ideas or concerns or maybe your language, your compiler, something that we need to know, we'd really love to hear from people. Uh, getting involved, if you're already a TC39 member, uh, we have a matrix chat, and then we have our, all of our events on the TC39 calendar and a contributing guide for getting involved. Uh, if you're not a member, you could just join the matrix chat and message me, uh, and I'll do whatever I can to help you get involved. But we meet um, monthly right now and talk about all of these new features, and then we have another meeting once a month to talk about uh, any issues or vague parts of the spec. Uh, cool. Yeah, thank you very much. That's my time. Thank you very much. Do we have questions? Um, earlier, you were showing the case uh, where a function was minimized, including the enemy of its arguments, and how even with hacky solutions, the debuggers were able to show the names of the arguments. So now I'm wondering, what is the current case uh, when you in the debugger, go to the scope of that function, open the terminal, and do console.log, and the name of an argument in the source code. So you've got a, sorry, you've got a debugger statement that you're stopped at, and in the 
debugger, you do see that the variable names are coming through, right? And then at that point, you open the console and you console log the yes. source variable name. That's a really good question. I'm actually not sure if that would work right now. I doubt that it would. Um, I think that the map is literally only applied to the, you know, to that sources screen, like inside the debugger. I don't think it's applied. That uh, couldn't be that useful. <laughs> I, I mean, it, it's definitely more useful than not having it, but uh, when debugging, you very often need an immediate console of sorts. Yeah, no, wait, I, sorry. I think I'm saying right now that would not work. I think that like with this um, scopes proposal, um, you know, I'll let Nick answer. But I, I'm saying right now, I'm I would bet that it okay, would not work. Okay. I do think that would be a really good idea. Because to that have was the next part of the yes, question. Yeah, if yeah. There is any plan to address? Uh, yeah, like part of the scopes proposal, uh, there would be like, well, it's still like not very stable that part. But like there would be a list of expressions to evaluate to get values of variables. So like even if the variable doesn't exist anymore, if it's been renamed, there would be a way to get to whatever the variable originally was. Uh, what would happen to the meaning five names? Uh, would they be shadow? So they would become. Uh, so the, as if they the didn't source exist? map, the source map gives all the info necessary to the browser to reconstruct exactly the original scope. Uh, but browser dev tools could choose whether they want to also expose like the this overlapping minified scope or to completely hide it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do think those are good questions. I don't the last thing I don't think we've talked about, like if we are trying to enable it, but it would also be uh, a tiny bit out of our direct hands because we're just we're working on the mapping itself and then hoping. But I do think it's a really good like what yeah, would well the console in the end it's Also part of the problem. <laughs> Because every time you are debugging, you, uh, well, not every time, but very often you need an immediate console where uh, a, a, it's not very ergonomic to know that uh, variable one is uh, 10 and variable two is 20. Sometimes you want to do variable one plus variable two or um, uh, calling some function that. Yes, so like with this, with this expressions feature of scopes, when like the the dev tools would be able to say, okay, this expression of writing a console references variable one. So before evaluating it, we replace var the variable one piece in this expression with whatever is stored in the source map to, to evaluate it so it references to the right places. Yeah. Glad to hear that. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, it press, oh no, it's working. Uh, all of this stuff with source maps, it seems very similar to what uh, native code compilers do with debug info. Mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering if you have done any research around what they do or have been working with any of those people. Yeah, when we, for a, a little bit less more recently, but when we first started off, we were working pretty closely with folks that had worked on Dwarf. Um, and I think getting like a lot of like help and feedback from them. I, I do think there's like some interesting discussions with like, in uh, particularly WebAssembly, like choosing between, you know, choosing debug formats. But yeah, we have been working uh, pretty closely with them and getting like direction and feedback in, in these things. I think the original scopes proposal was designed by someone who worked on Dwarf. So, um, so just just for for background, at the beginning of the process, when we talked to people working on Dwarf. Uh, there, there actually was an implementation in Chrome of Dwarf WebAssembly support, but then in the tooling side, also made by Chrome, they decided not to bother supporting it because there was kind of no benefit that they saw over the uh, uh, source map. So in general, when we consulted the different people in the ecosystem, uh, there was a lot more interest in incrementally evolving source maps that seemed a lot more deployable than switching to a new format. But this whole environment scopes thing is sort of filling in the biggest, you know, essential core dwarf feature that's missing. Not that it's it's all of dwarf, but it's yeah. It's and I think focus. a big focus that we have going forward now is like really working with uh, pretty much everyone integrating with WebAssembly right now to like try to improve the experience there. Um, that's like one of our main one of our main targets is like trying. I mean, we're working a lot with Artem and Kotlin and trying to make sure that like the because th there's a lot of challenges there with trying to get source maps to work well for like native generated WebAssembly code. 
So I also wanted to ask, uh, why does Bloomberg invest in source maps? Why does Bloomberg why, invest why, in? Why do you get work time to do this? Why do I get work time to do this? Um, yeah, so I, I think in general, well, first of all, because Bloomberg's amazing and invests in like a ton of great stuff, but I think in general, like this whole like experience of like d of debugging and of like um, error stacks, all these different things are like vitally important to us. Like we it, like the pasta source maps, like a good example of something that we had already before I joined heavily invested in. So I think that like um, I'm not sure what you're going for here exactly, Dan. But uh, yeah, I think in general like uh, this experience is is great, is really needed. Like it's very very hard to have large apps and crash reports and debugging and all that stuff. And I do think like our general approach is not to continue down. Uh, some single repo that we build or whatever, but really try to like take that and extend it out into like some kind of standards or open body. So, there uh, and now I hear about Dwarf. There is another nice feature that Dwarf has, and Source Maps doesn't. You mentioned earlier TypeScript, but and there is also the case of binary apps. And something you can do in GDB or any debugger is see the type of a value. Now, uh, it's, it's, well, sorry, the, yeah, the, the, this gets complicated in the case of JavaScript. <laughs> so imagine the native case where you have a pointer in a debugger. Um, if that pointer is null, you know not only that it's a null pointer, but you can also know the type of what is, uh, should be pointed. Because um, if you have debugging symbols, it will say the type of uh, that piece of the stack or whatever part of the memory where that variable was. Are there any plans to support types in source maps for languages that use them, such as anything compiled with um, uh, WebAssembly or even TypeScript? I don't, I don't think we have any current plans for that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, I think we'd be definitely open to like talking about it, but no, I don't, I don't think we've done any, uh, any work so far into like trying to preserve type information like that. Yeah, I mean, Artem would be great to. Yeah, I, I can like a bit share something. I mean, in source map, we uh, don't have anything to encode, but for n right now, at least in Chrome, you have information about types. I mean, even for just a regular numbers or for types, if we talk about like GC proposal, so you have like mm -hmm. uh, structure with type and the value itself. Uh, and yeah, with Kotlin, we solve it like pretty simple. So we just try to keep uh, the same full qualified name of the type inside the binary as we have like in the source code. So you see, for example, if it's Kotlin string, so you see this Kotlin string, but the type right now is null. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, definitely it's not the perfect solution. So maybe we see need to think about it to code yeah. something in source Yeah, I think we, can, we could definitely look into doing some stuff in that area. All right, any more questions? All right, thank you, Junior. Yeah, thank, thank you, you all very so much. much. And